Now, the title of today's message is From Tragedy to Triumph. And we're going to be in 1 Samuel. We're going to begin in chapter 27. And we're going to go actually all the way through to, to chapter 30. We won't read every verse. But we're going to kind of tell a story this morning. That I think could really uh, encourage your life. And the reason I think that is because maybe someone's here today. And they feel like their life is in a place of tragedy. Maybe you're here today and you feel like there's just no way to recover from what you're going through. But I'm here to tell you today that we serve a God that can turn our tragedies into triumph. And I'm going to show you one example of that today through the life of David. And so let's begin reading there in 1 Samuel 27 at verse 1. It says, And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines... And Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. Then David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Ahash, the son of Maok, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Ahash at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives. Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath. So he sought him no more. Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Ahash gave Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag had belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And so we see here that David is living in exile. David's country was the land of Israel. That's where he was meant to be. But here we see him living with the Philistines. And, you know, here's the thing. God didn't create us to live in exile. What he created us for was to be his children and to live in his kingdom. But yet David was living in the land of the Philistines. See, David knew what he was created for. Listen to David's own words in Psalms 139, 14 through 18. He said this. He says, I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet they were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me. Oh God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. David knew how special he was. And can I tell you something? All of those verses I just read applies to each one of us today. We're that special in the eyes of God. But unfortunately, although God had wonderfully made us to be His children and to dwell in His kingdom, Satan has captured all of us by sin and he's forced us into exile in a foreign land. We're sinners from birth. Romans 5.12 says, Through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. A forced exile. Now, now there's really two types of exile. And the first one is a forced removal from one's country. Now, spiritually speaking, this is the sinner that's never trusted Christ as his Savior. And so from birth, he's been in a forced exile by what I just explained, how that Satan has forced us into the exile of sin, and that has separated us from the kingdom of God where we belong. You know, Jesus tells us in John 8.34 that whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Isaiah 59.2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. 
So we're talking about the exile of a forced removal. And so Satan has forcefully removed us from God's kingdom from birth. And then there's another type of exile. It's a self-imposed absence from one's country. Self-imposed. This represents a believer that becomes a backslider. One who's been saved and yet chooses to turn their back on God's kingdom and run to a foreign land. Just like the prodigal son. In Luke 15, 13, we read, The younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. A self-imposed absence from one's country. And in our passage today, we see a picture of the latter as David chooses to take his journey into a far country. We also see the resultant tragedy of his sins. You, you know that old expression that says sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. And so let's look at David's choices that led to his self-imposed exile. Let's look at that. First, we see that David feared man more than God. And so, because of that fear of men, he took matters into his own hands. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, you know what we see there? We see David being anointed as the next king of Israel. We see that story. And so God had a plan for him. God had a plan, but yet as we read the verse 1 of chapter 27, we see that David ran. Look at it again. It says, And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. So here's David. He knows he's created special by God. He knows he's been anointed to be the king of Israel. But because of the fear of Saul, he takes matters into his own hands. He, he runs away from God's plan for his life. And he runs to the Philistine land. He ran away. But you know, before we pass too harsh a judgment on David, let's remember that he wasn't the only one. Moses ran away. Jonah ran away. Peter ran away. The disciples ran away on the night that they came and arrested Jesus. Listen, probably uh, a lot of us in here at some time in our life have ran away from God's greatest plan for our life. David feared and therefore David fled. And he fled for the false security and the comfort of the world. Look at verse 2. It says, Then David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achesh, the son of Maok, king of Gath. He fled to the land of Gath. Do you know who else lived in the land of Gath? Who else was from there? Anybody know? Goliath. Goliath was from the land of Gath. So now David is living in the land of his enemies. He's living with the Philistines. He's living in Gath. And, and I want to ask you this question. Have you ever ran away from God to the false security and the false comfort of the world? Instead of staying on God's path, it gets a little rough and you just kind of turn your back on God and you just run to the world because it's, it's easier. David fled to that false security. And then we see that David faded away from the purpose and the plans of God. He just faded away. Look at verse 3 and 4. It says, So David dwelt with Achesh at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, and Abel's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. He sought him no more. David just kind of faded away from Saul's vision, from Saul's sight. David, once he went to this foreign land, he just kind of faded away from all the purposes and plans of God, but he also had this kind of sense of self-comfort that he had faded away from the desire of Saul to destroy him. And you know what we learned from that? 
We learn that if we just surrender to the world, we'll be left alone. Why? Because Satan has us right where he wants us. He has us out of the way. He has us off in the distance somewhere. We're making no impact for God's kingdom. We're making no impact for God's plan. And, and he's happy with that. Listen, if you're not if you're not living for the Lord and trying to serve the Lord and, and trying to live your faith and make an impact on other people's lives, if you're not doing all that, Satan won't bother you too much. He loves silent Christians. And so David just faded away. And, and when he faded away, he found easy acceptance in the camp of the enemy. Look at verse. Uh, six. It said, so Achesh gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag had belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Easy acceptance in the presence of his enemies. He goes there and he says, just give me any place. And, he, and his enemy, the enemy king goes, sure, I'll give you this place over here. He's probably thinking, now I can keep an eye on it. Now he's not in Jerusalem. He's not going to make an impact anymore. He's going to serve me now. And so he found that easy acceptance. You know, we need to be careful about the company we keep. You know why? Because misery loves company. When, when you keep the wrong company, whatever, more than likely, that person is going to drag you down to their level. That person is going to, instead of you influencing them, they're going to influence you and they're going to pull you down to whatever level they're on. They're going to influence you to live more of a worldly life, to, to live more according to that false sense of security and comfort, to do the things that uh, just uh, are denying the power of God in your life. And that's exactly what happened to David. He goes to this foreign land. He, he flees there. He fades away there. And then that foreign king truly accepts David. He's like, okay, he's, he's going to be one of us. I'll give him a little land. I'll keep an eye on him. He'll serve me from now on. That's how it is for Satan in our lives. He wants us to flee. He wants us to get away so far away from God's plan. And he wants us to get around the wrong crowd. And he wants to live a life that does nothing to please God. And then he'll leave us alone and he'll say, I'll just leave him right there because I can keep and not only that, we see that David followed his passions and found temporary satisfaction. Now listen to me. You can get out of God's will and you can go your own way and you can be living for all the things in the world and there's some temporary satisfaction in that. There is. You can, you can find some amount of happiness. And, and so that's what was happening with David. Read along with me as I read verses 8 through 12. And David and his men went up and raided Gezerites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old. And as you go to shore, even as far as the land of Egypt, whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achesh would say, where have you made a raid today? And David would say, against the southern areas of Judah, against the southern area of the Jeremites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. You know what he's doing? He's lying to them. He's saying, oh, I'm, I'm going down to Israel and I'm raiding them. It says, David would say, neither man nor one woman alive. To bring news to Gath, saying, Least they should inform on us, saying, Thus David did. And this was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achash believed David, saying, He has made his people of Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. All that time that he was in that foreign land, he was following his passion. Listen, David was a warrior. God. David was the one that killed Goliath as a boy. David was the one that they would sing the song about, you know, Saul had killed his thousands, but David had killed his ten thousands. David was a warrior for God. He was. But once he got out of God's will, and once he got out of God's way, and once he got out of God's plan, he was no longer a warrior for God. But that warrior passion still burned in him. 
And so what was what God put in him to bring glory to God, he takes it to the world and he's giving glory to the world with it. And he's doing it, he's doing all of this for his own satisfaction. Now they're going and raiding, they're being that the warriors that they are, they're fulfilling that passion, but they're doing it all for the wrong reasons. How many people have a giftedness from God, but yet they're they're just surrendering it all to the world? Giving it all to the world. That's what David was doing. He went AWOL on God, but that warrior passion would not go out. And so he was using what God had given him in the wrong way to satisfy himself. It's that him and his men went out and attacked the land. And so we see there that David fell to his lowest point. You know, as we read on through chapter 29, we're not going to read that chapter today, but go home today and read it. But as you read chapter 29, you're going to see the story of how low David fell. He literally brought his men to the battlefield when the Philistines were going to attack Israel. He brought his men to the battlefield to fight with the Philistines against Israel, the nation that he was going to be king of. And he brought all this. That's how low he had failed. He's willing to not only live with the enemy, now he's willing to fight with the enemy. How many of us today get so caught up in the things of the world that, that we reject the things of God because they, they're against the things of the world? So, so many realities today where we don't want to hear God's Word anymore because it's not popular and the popular stances of the things of this world, we don't want to offend anybody. So we don't want to hear that. Don't tell me that's wrong because i got friends doing that. And there he was in the enemy's ranks, ready to go to battle against his own people. Unbelievable. And so we see David's resulting tragedy in all that because he had let himself get to this place. Now let me tell you what happened. When he went to go to battle, Achash was like, all right, come on, fight with us. But the other lords of the Philistines was like, uh-uh. We don't trust him. He's an Israelite. All his men are Israelites. We don't trust them. And we will not fight with them in battle because they'll turn on us. And so they sent them home. And so, as they go home, we pick up the story in chapter 30 and verse 1, and we see that their city is burned. Look at verse 1. It says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag, attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire. Remember that expression. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. And now David and his men were paying the cost of their sins. Their city burned. Not only was their city burned, their families were captured. Look at verse 2. They had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. And thirdly, we see that their souls are grieved over this. Look at verse 4. It says, Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Man, that's grief right there. Now David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved and every man for his sons and daughters. Listen, our sin doesn't just hurt us. Our sin can destroy the people around us. What we do impacts other people. With the city burned, families captured, souls grieved, his life threatened, David finds himself in that valley of the shadow of death that he writes about in Psalm 23. You know, here's the thing. Here's the lesson. No one can live however they want. Fulfilling their lusts, fulfilling their personal desires, and not expect that there's going to be payment demanded for that. 
And now they were paying for all their sinful living. Numbers 32, 23 says, be sure your sins will find you out. I think about Galatians 7, 8. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he'll also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will also of the flesh reap corruption. See, here's the thing. God will let you go to a place where the only hope you have is to turn to Him. I call it the dead end road. God will let you go all the way to the end of that dead end road that you're on to get your attention to turn to Him. And that's exactly what David had to do. He finally hit the dead end road. He had no other place to turn but to God. And that's exactly what he did. And now we see David's repentance. You know, the only answer to our troubles is repentance. Think about 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what repentance is. It goes on in verse 10. It says, if we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. That's an unrepentant and prideful. See, there may be someone in here today that's unrepentant and prideful even though everything's going wrong in their life. But then there may be someone else here today that's just ready to confess their sins, repent of their sins, and receive the forgiveness that's promised there in 1 John 1, 9. And that's what David did. Look at the second part of the sixth verse in 1 Samuel 30. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now, we have to read a little bit between the lines because it doesn't give any details there, but I will tell you that the only way that David could have strengthened himself with the Lord was to first find repentance with the Lord. We're not given that whole story, but I assure you that David had to repent of his sins before the Lord was ready to listen to his prayers. But once he made that time of repentance, it says he strengthened himself in the Lord and he got right with God. He got right with Him. And you know what? Here's the thing. God's faithful. The moment a person agrees with God about their sins, which is what David had to do. God knew he was wrong. David had to admit he was wrong. When we're wrong, God knows we're wrong. We have to admit we're wrong. That's what repentance is. It's agreeing with God. Yes, God, you got me. I'm, I'm out of your will. I'm wrong. I, I repent of that. And, but here's the thing is that the moment that we agree with God, the moment that we confess our sins, He will forgive our repentant heart. He'll forgive us. Christ paid for all of our sins on the cross before we was ever born. The debt has been paid. We just need to go to God to receive the forgiveness. He'll forgive all of our sins. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what I just read in 1 John 1 9. God is so faithful. So we see that David strengthened himself. We also see that David surrendered. Now, once you repent and once you get that strength back from the Lord, you know what you got to do? You got to surrender to his will again. Look at verse 7. Then David said to Abithar the priest, the Himling son, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abithar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? You know what's important about that right there? We're talking about surrendering to God's plan again. The first time in all these chapters that we're reading this story, it's the first time. The first time we called the Lord. Man, we try to go through this life doing it our way. We think we got the best plan. We just keep God in a box like, in case of emergency, break the glass. That's not how it's meant to be. But for the first time in this whole journey that David's gone through, he finally prays to the Lord. He surrendered and God forgave him. I mean, like we said earlier, that as soon as we repent, He forgives. Listen, when we confess, God forgives. There was not a delay in God's answer. Look at God's answer, still in verse 8. It said, And He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now David's just gotten right with God. 
You would think God would give them a time out. You would think, well, David, you've got to prove yourself before I let you do anything for me again. That's how we think. We think that God puts us in time out. We think that God uh, just wants to punish us. We think that He will never use us again. But listen, all God wants is for us to be walking in agreement with Him. He forgets the past. Christ died for our past. We can forget the past. We don't have to wait for the other shoe to drop. Listen, as soon as we repent and, and we get God's grace in our life again and we get surrendered to Him again and back on His path again, we can just keep on moving forward. He says, David, go after him because you're going to recover all. And so we see David's divine pursuit. First, we see David's obedience. Look at verse 9. It says, So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Be sure, for those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued, he and 400 men from 200 stayed behind, who were so weary that they could not cross brook Be sure. God's deliverance is found on God's path. I mean, when we look at that verse 8 and what God said to David, first God gave David a path. He said, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. Go that way, David. Go. And then God gave him a promise. He says, you'll surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Listen, if we follow God's path and His plan for our life, He'll fulfill all of His promises to us. He'll do everything He says He'll do. And that's the promise He's making to David right now. So we see David's obedience. He pursues. And then we see God's provision. Look in 1 Samuel, starting in verse 11, at how God brought this uh, recovery about. Then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate and they let him drink water. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him. For he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. Then David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area of the uh, Cherethites in the territory which belongs to Judah. And of the southern area of Caleb and we burned Ziklag with fire. There you go. He was there. He was an eyewitness. Verse 15 says, And David said to him, Can you take me down to this tree? So he said, swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this tree. And when he had brought him down, there they were, spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. God's provision. Once David got back on God's divine path, he found God's provision. A servant boy left behind. That worthless servant boy to the world became a very important young man to the plan of God. And so he was able to lead them right to the place where everything that was taken was held captive. And so they find themselves there. And then we see God's victory. Look at verse 17 and 19. It says, Then David attacked them from twilight the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, son or daughter, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. God turned David's tragedy into triumph. And I just want to ask you this. Just comparing your life to David's story. Where are you at in that journey? Have you ran to a far country and you're living in exile? Have you faded away from God's plan for your life? Have, have you made some poor choices that have resulted in tragedy? And you're wondering, will you ever recover? Do you need to repent and get back on God's divine path? Do you want to recover all the things that you've lost? 
Listen, the key is your relationship with Christ. That's the key. Until David got right with the Lord, he was living in tragedy. But once he come back to God, repented to God, got back on God's plan, got back into God's obedience, almost immediately, he claimed the victory. God wants us living in victory. 